Welcome back to Low Bug Garage. In this episode, I'm going to see if I can get this half track running again without spending a lot of money. Now this carburetor had a bit of an issue when I was uh, moving the half track around in order to get it ready for the paint job. Let me show you. I just had some major flooding issues. I think the float just stuck down and uh, let the bowl overflow. go do some exploratory surgery here and figure out what's really wrong. I don't think anything else is gonna fall in too much. There we go. I was gonna order a needle and seat for it so I actually had some new parts in here, possibly some gaskets and things. Uh, so I pulled it off to make sure I got the right numbers to know which Stromberg carburetor it is. Um, this is a Rochester. Now I'm gonna go yank the carb off the other half track and see what that is. This looks like the great carburetor. Let's clean it up and see what the number says. That's what we want to see. That's a Stromberg. It's kind of hard to read the numbers there, so I'm going to use a paint stick. There we go. That's a lot easier to read. Now this is a Stromberg AAV2, which is uh, what's supposed to be on a half track. And uh, right off, I noticed, besides the long layer of dirt on it, the accelerator pump is just sort of free-floating in mid-air. Uh, nothing is actually actuating that. It's probably an arm that goes from here to there, and then a lot rod that goes down. So we're going to have to overcome that one. But uh, let's look inside and see if it's even worth working with this carburetor. Now, the throttle blades move freely, which is good. There is play on the shaft, which is not good. But I've seen worse, so uh, I think this is going to be okay. It wiggles just a little bit. No fluid inside the uh, floats. They actually look real nice. This carburetor doesn't look too bad. I think we're going to be okay with this one. Now, you run into some stuff, like right here. That looks like it unscrews. There's a flat blade slot across it, but there's something in the way. Uh, I bet they make a special wrench that has a tang on either side you can use to take this off. I don't have one, so I'm going to use is two tiny flat blade screwdrivers. So now I have a screwdriver, one on each side, take a small adjustable, and use that to twist the screwdrivers. There we go. Then you just unscrew it without any damage or having to get the special tool. I got the cheapest one I could find. I think it was like $29, $30, something like that. And it comes with a nice little basket. Now I've already done the big pieces through there. I'm gonna dump all the little parts in the basket. Give them a good soaking. Now this is kind of interesting. This is my old needle and seat. And that's the new one that came with the kit. There's no actual point to this. It just got a little, uh, rubber tip on it. Completely different style than what was in there originally. They both basically have the same length when closed. It looks like it'll be a replacement. So I'm going to go ahead and try that new style and obviously I'm going to keep the old ones just in case but we're going to give that a shot. Now the base of this carburetor is actually steel and it was originally painted black so I'm going to go ahead and repaint it black after I clean it up. Got the bottom end painted and I'll go ahead and install that. Now, this kit came with two sets of instructions. The one that was actually in the kit and a big book that the uh, place sent me uh, with like 70 odd pages of stuff. 
Both of them say to do the uh, idle mixture screws out one turn. I checked before I took it apart, they were out two and a half turns. So we'll go one and see how it goes. And maybe it was so far because of other issues with the carburetor. And uh, there we go. Everything that was on this carburetor is back together and uh, it's pretty much as I took it off the half track. But of course it's not complete because it's missing the entire accelerator pump linkage. I realized two important things here. One, I can get to that accelerator pump linkage pretty easily with a carburetor on here. And two, you don't actually need the accelerator pump to run the motor. So uh, basically you only need it for an extra sort of gas when you hit the throttle fast. I'm just going to powder this around the yard. So I'm going to wait a little bit on doing that linkage and see if I can come up with an original one to bolt on here because I can add it after I get this up and running. I cleaned up this data plate a little bit and uh, got most of the paint off it. All the original paint was already gone. It was just the yellow I had to take off. Now here's the current driver's side door latch. Simple and effective. It works. You can't actually operate it from the outside at all. You've got to do this to get in and out. I think we can do better than that. Alright, time to remove this old latch. We'll pop on the new one. Luckily, after taking apart that M15A1, I've got a whole box of bolts that are just the right head. There we go. Now a handle. Last piece of this little latch. There we go, working door latch. Now working on this half track, I'm working on a vehicle that's about 80 years old and they didn't make that medium to begin with. When working on a vehicle like that, costs can get out of control real easy. But you can cut corners and get stuff pretty reasonable. Let me show you. Now one of the best ways to do that is uh, some online resource. Because if it's a vehicle like these half tracks where a lot of people uh, like them, they'll start putting together lists of spare parts and things you can get on replacement parts. And I found a list just like that on halftrackinfo.com. And this basically lists a whole bunch of generic part numbers that are equivalents to what is on the half track at reasonable prices. So far I've got an oil filter, uh, 1458, distributor cap, uh, $9.16, distributor rotor, uh, $4.70, uh, breaker points, $5.22. Uh, condenser, $3.95. Then I also got a gas pedal, 15 bucks on eBay. They actually still make these. It's for uh, like a 30s Ford car, but uh, they're like 25 bucks for a reproduction. This is an old stock, dough in something, but that's what they used. So, got a brand new gas pedal. Then, some stuff is kind of equivalent to a much higher volume vehicle, like the uh, MB Jeeps. Those flat fender Jeeps from the military era, they made a lot of those. And there's a lot still around, and there's a lot of demand for parts. So that stuff's easy to get. Uh, here is a choke cable. Nice olive drab one that says choke, and uh, it'll work fine. And then, when I got on the subject of MBs, uh, I need gauges for this half track. And those gauges are expensive. They're a big five inch gauge with multiple ones in there. I have not found any of those cheap. But for 35 bucks, I got this box. And this is a full set of MB reproduction gauges with the olive drab bezel and the right type of typeface and all that. Now these are the wrong size, but I've got the coolant temperature, fuel gauge, probably won't use that because I'll be on a boat tank. Oil pressure, definitely need that one. Amp meter and speedometer. For all of these, for 35 bucks, I really can't beat the price and I'll use what I need, particularly oil pressure and temperature. Those are the critical ones. So these aren't original, but they're the right style and they would fit the vehicle and they'll work. And by doing stuff like that and uh, using information that other people have compiled, I should be able to 
keep this cost pretty reasonable. So now, let's install some of this stuff. All right, here's the old gas pedal. Uh, all the rubber's gone, nothing was actually attaching it, but there's only one bolt to take it out, so let's get this fixed. There's the new replacement, and same height, same kind of mount. The hinge is actually folded over the bolt, but I can get an open end on there. Let me try to get it from the back side here. Bolt access is not the easiest thing here. Let's try it from this angle. All this to get one little bolt. Here's the final solution. The nut is in a pair of vice grips, which is stuck to the frame with a welding magnet. And I think I can actually get this in. Yep, I got it. Snug that down. Pop that in. There we go. We got a new gas pedal. Finally. Now I want to do some decorations on this vehicle just for fun. And uh, this is what I was planning on putting on the door. Now I've seen these in a lot of half tracks, but luckily I talked to uh, Dave at World War II Restorations. I'll put a link to his channel in the description. But he let me know that the circle was only used on vehicles actually shipped to Europe. Uh, if it wasn't shipped to Europe, it didn't have the circle. And this probably was never shipped to Europe because I doubt they ever would have shipped it back. So, this is what it should have. I made the graphics the wrong size for a particular reason. Uh, my vinyl is 12 inches wide. I can't make them any bigger. I got some uh, tape to make marks. I got a level so my eyeball doesn't go sideways and uh, see if we can put these on kind of straight. So what I'm doing here, I measured the door, I put a tape line at halfway so it's centered this way. Then I kind of eyeballed up and down to make it look kind of right. Alright, so I got a piece of tape marked on this side and then I'm going to use the level to put another piece of tape over here and then kind of just shove it on there. I think you're supposed to spray something on here, I forget what. Uh, in order to make him be able to maneuver him around a little bit. I'm just going to stick it on and hope it goes right the first time. There's no way that could ever go wrong. Peel that back. Fold this over. That's not going well already. It's like a floppy starfish. Alright, now we're getting somewhere. Lining up that side, that side, this point, and... I'm going to start sticking it on, for better or worse. Oh, there it moved. Yeah, the whole thing's sliding. Alright, let's try that again. My kids can put on stickers all day long and whatever they want. Why do I not have the ability to operate a sticker? All right, it's on there for better or worse. Let's back up and see how it looks from a distance. That's not half bad, I'm okay with that. So let's cut another one out for the other door. Now on this passenger door, I had a lot of trouble getting this to move out all the way. It's spring-loaded, so you could push it in easy enough, but to get it to pop out, you can't really push it from the backside. Until now. I went and drilled a small hole. Now, to free this up, I can actually add oil in from the backside and pretty much fill it up. And then I can tap it out, then pull it in. And pull it in. Now before it was only sticking out about halfway under its own spring pressure. Seems to be going most of the way now. But I can really work that oil in and get it to move by having just a little access hole. And I don't think anyone will notice that. I also painted another set of handles black to match the other side. And I didn't bother painting these because the end of that one's broken off. So I'm going to take a good set. This latch has been losing a lot of rust since I got some oil in there. I guess it's a good thing if the rust comes out. There we go. That should work better. 
using my list of parts, I also found the shift knob. Uh, this is for a tractor, but uh, this should, according to the list, be a direct fit. So let's see, because I have absolutely no knobs on anything here. Now this is a little under nine bucks a piece delivered, and fits perfect. There, no more grabbing the threads. Now, they look different on the transfer case levers, at least the way it mounts, but went over to this half track and looked at the transfer case levers here. This one still has a knob that looks the same and threads. And this one looks different, but I'm thinking what I'm seeing is the little metal insert inside the plastic knob. So basically the plastic just broke away and that's the metal insert that it was molded around. So I think that'll unscrew. Let's find out. Let's see what a pipe wrench does. Oh yeah, that unscrews. Luckily I expected that was the case, so I bought three knobs. My hands are gonna thank me for this. Let's try the last one. Interestingly, these two sleeves were actually different, but they both have the same thread, so it must have been two different knob suppliers. Eh, we're better now. Now I've got the gauges out. My original intention was to reuse the wiring harness as is and just reattach it. But this is the main power wire that fed the amp meter. And that is absolutely no insulation. It wasn't this bad when I started. This stuff is just absolutely flaking right off. Every time I touch something, the insulation just falls apart. So, I can't leave this in this dashboard. I considered throwing some rubber tubing over the exposed area to re-insulate it, but somewhere down the line, inside where I won't see it, it's going to do the same thing all over again. I'm going to pull this harness out entirely because that will cause a fire at some point. Now that oil pressure line is a flare fitting, and this deep oil pressure gauge is a uh, pipe thread fitting. So I need an adapter. Luckily, whoever hacked up the dash on this uh, parts half track had the same issue. And I found the adapter right here, going between a flare and a pipe thread. Then the other thing I found, the wiring isn't as bad, but the same issue. These big high power cables, the insulation is just flaking off of. I considered stealing the wire harness from this one and install it in the other one, but this one's gonna have the same issue. Well, I pulled all the damaged wire out of the dashboard, left me a lot more room to work with. A lot of old insulation fell off there. So I'm just going to put new wire for everything I'm using. So we're going to start the wiring all the way in the battery compartment. We're going to replace the uh, both cables with the original one that I pulled out of the other half track. Here we have the two big holes in the dash. I cleared out all the excess wiring that was frayed and falling apart, and that was most of it. But uh, I'm starting to run some new wire in here, and I'm about ready to do something with the gauges. Now we have a gauge adapter. I cut out that plate with the three holes, and I found some EcoSure paint. This stuff was uh, less than six bucks a can, and supposedly it's the same color code, the flat green 34052. So uh, I painted that plate. We'll see how it matches. And this is the plate here. And that's not bad. I think this is a little shinier, but close enough. Now I'm gonna stick the gauges in this plate I have three holes to mount it on. And these three holes are inside this circle. So I can put that on and the bolts go straight through. They don't hit the actual dashboard. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a bolt, then I'm gonna put a big flat washer on the inside. And when I tighten that down, that's gonna sandwich this on the edge here. So basically what I'll have is a gauge panel that fits in the factory holes. It doesn't damage the dashboard at all. So original gauges could be put in later. But for now, I'll have this bolted in 
and I think it'll look okay enough and work. And that's the big thing. It's got to work. Got the oil pressure gauge hooked up to the original line. Now I got the mechanical coolant temperature gauge, and so I've got to fish this whole wire all the way through. Mechanical gauges are nice because they're reliable and they don't take a bunch of wiring, but they do take fishing this through. Now I'm on to the other gaping hole. And basically I did the same thing, made a plate that fits over with holes that'll fit under so I don't damage the dashboard. And I made another hole for the actual speedometer. It came with my gauge kit. Now this speedometer doesn't work. There's the speedometer and there's the speedometer cable. Obviously both male threads. A coupling nut would hook them up, but um, the cable's broken anyway, so I'm not going to worry about that right now. This is not going to be functional, but it's just going to fill up the hole in the dash. And at some point, maybe I'll fix the cable and put a coupler nut between the two to connect them, but uh, probably not. Well, it definitely fills out the dash a little better. Here's the main power in from the battery, going straight to the starter solenoid. This is the lead going to my ammeter. I picked this wire because I had it lying around, and it had a huge fuse in it. Uh, this is a 60 amp one. Now this generator, if I don't know if you can read that, but it puts out 55 amps maximum. So that 60 amp fuse should handle everything this can put out. Now I'm going to show you my wiring I'm doing here. The first thing, this is the main feed coming from the battery. This is going through the gauge that's going to measure the amperage both in and out of the battery. Now this is the kind of meter they always used to use. These are not common anymore. Usually you'll see a voltmeter. And the reason for that is in order to measure the amperage, you need to have your battery on one side and all the loads on the other. So every bit of electrical power that goes in your entire vehicle goes through this one meter. It wasn't too bad when you're running points ignition and a mechanical fuel pump, but modern cars run a lot of amps. You don't want that much power going through your dashboard. So that's why you don't see these ammeters anymore. Um, they're just not practical and pretty much a fire hazard. But for a low power vehicle like this, it's going to be fine. So I have my battery coming in to the plus B terminal, and the plus L, which is our load, is where everything's coming out. Now I have three things that I want to power up with electricity here. I got the ignition, the starter, and the fuel pump. And all of those I want on a separate fuse. So let me show you how I did that. I had this really cheap fuse box lying around. It was only a couple bucks. They have individual fuses. Everyone's individual, they're not connected. So it's not like you have a power in and it goes to everything. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the power feed from this ammeter into one circuit. Now that one, I put a 30 amp fuse on. So all our draw should be less than 30 amps, otherwise this one's gonna pop. And I want everything to be switched with the ignition switch. So on the other side of that 30 amp fuse, I'm going to hook the ignition switch. So now power is gonna go in through that fuse to this switch. Then from this switch, I wanna power all three accessories. And then I jumpered it. So basically these three are all powered off the switch. So now when the switch turns on, all three of these fuses power up. Now these are 15 amp ones. I really don't need this big of a fuse. I'll probably go smaller later, but this is what I had lying around. So now I have three circuits and that's where I wanna hook all my other stuff. I wanna hook my uh, starter, which I tagged in green, cause it's gonna go. And then I also have the fuel pump, which fuels kinda like water. So I tagged that one with a blue stripe. And then right here, I don't know if you can see it, it's under there, this is the coil wire. So I'm gonna hook all three of the, those up to these fuses Turn the switch on, you've got your fuel pump, you've got your ignition, and the starter button's live. Now I'm going to do all this inside the dashboard. When I removed a few things, I left marks where it's not painted. Um, that's the choke cable. i got to touch that up. i got to touch this other cable up. The ignition switch will cover that up. This is a block off plate, and uh, I'm just going to paint where that was in case I use something different there. And a little bit of this one, this switch panel moved, so I have to touch that up. And I'm going to go ahead and touch this up now. That way it's still wet while I work on the wiring and I can stick my hands in it. Oddly enough, there are holes already in this plate from another component 
they were the exact spacing I needed for this fuse box. So it's bolted in without drilling any holes at all. Well, now I'm working on the fuel system on this half track. I've got the electric pump that used to lay on the floor on the passenger side. I went and mounted it right up there into a frame rail. And it's going to go and feed the original fuel filter here. And then it's going to go somewhere, but the lines aren't here. Someone has disconnected those. I found the end of the line here, sort of flopping around. And there's the line that used to go to the um, fuel pump. Here we have the filter, and there's the line I need. And that goes all the way up to right here. So I need to remove that. There's a couple of little clips. Got to get it out of those holes. That actually is turning surprisingly easy. While I'm here, I should probably see which is the better filter. Already smells like old gas. Oh, there's liquid in here. Wow. Never seen black gasoline before. That is officially the worst fuel filter I've ever seen. I'm also noticing there's no element in there. Um, I assume there's supposed to be one. That's pretty bad. I actually had thoughts of stealing this fuel filter and putting it on the other one. We're just going to leave this one right here. There, there's nothing we need out of this one. Except the line. Let's take the line. Well, I got the line through the holes, even saved the rubber grommets, and got all the way back to the filter. Now, I probably should see what's inside there after looking at the other one. I think part of the filter broke internally. Which means that really dirty one on the other half track is the good one. And I'm going to have to yank this whole unit out because something broke and it's going to leak fuel now. I don't have that big filter clean yet, so I just threw an inline filter for now. Um, it's temporary. It'll probably be there for 10 years or so. Maybe more. Now I have most of the fuel system hooked up. I haven't made the final connection between that line I put in from the old half track and the one going to the carb because I remember what that fuel filter looked like. So I want to clear out that line too. Now I got to test the fuel pump. So the line is now just connected to this jug. I'm going to run some fuel through it and that should clear it out. Let's see what comes out of that line. That's promising. Well, it started off pretty muddy, but it's getting clearer. We'll let that run for a minute or two. Well, that looks pretty clear, so I'm going to shut down the pump, and uh, I think we have a good line now. I can do the final connection. I'm really glad I ran some fuel through that line, because I don't want my carburetor looking like that. Moment of truth time here. I got the whole fuel system hooked up, ready to pressurize it. We'll see if that weird rubber tip float thing actually seals this carburetor or if we end up a big flooded mess. And I gotta start over. Let's find out. Apparently I should have actually tightened this fitting more than finger tight. Or what I mean to say is, uh, that was a good way to test that the fuel is all the way up to the carburetor, so now we know. Um, clearly that was beneficial, not just me forgetting to do it. All right. Try this again. Fuel pump is on again. I don't see any leaks. It looks like this is a little plug to see where the level is on the carburetor. So I'm gonna pull that out while it's pressurized and see what happens. Maybe we'll just loosen a little bit at first. 
I don't see anything dribbling. Oh, there's fuel pouring out. Okay, so we have a carburetor full of fuel. We have an arm full of fuel. We have an engine covered in fuel. Um, all right, that probably wasn't my best idea. Another learn from my mistakes moment. So now I'm going to let this sit and evaporate, and then I'm going to try to start it. While well, that fuel is evaporating, I'm going to take care of a few more things, like the tilt cable, which I probably would have wanted to start it anyway. Before you feed the choke cable all the way through, remember to put the nut on. Let's pull that back out of here. There we go. Looks dry under there. You can try to fire it. Moment of truth. Fingers crossed. It runs! I'm sure I got gas in the oil when the car was flooding, but now that it's not flooding, I think it's time to change it and put some fresh stuff in. It smells like gas. That is on there. Whoever tightened that did it way too much. Uh, can give up on the proper wrench and go to a eight point socket. There we go. That filter housing holds a pretty good chunk of oil. I'm going to fill this up with oil, that way we, have, we don't have to have the oil pump pump at all. I'm just going to pour fresh oil right in the top. Getting there. Alright, slightly over full. Now this is supposed to take 12 quarts, which is 3 gallons. So I'm going to put in 2 gallons and then check it. We'll see what we got. Alright, we've got just a little above low, so that's good. Now I've got about two and three quarter gallon in here, which is pretty close to what it's supposed to take. And it's right up to the high mark on the stick. So uh, I'm gonna call it good. We're gonna be in the mark somewhere once it's running, even if it pumps some through somewhere. I'll check it again afterwards, but we'll be fine. It's gonna be somewhere between the marks. Now I've been running just an oil pressure gauge on the side of the block. And I check it every once in a while, and it's always had oil pressure. But now I've got an oil pressure gauge in the interior. And that gauge is hooked up to this line right here. So all I have to do is connect this line and the gauge inside will work. Hooked up the line, connecting the oil pressure, put a loop in it so as that motor vibrates, that'll help it flex a little bit. Last gauge, I've got to put this coolant temperature sensor in that hole. Hopefully I can get the sensor out. Hmm. The sensor's still in there. Wire's out. Which means now I gotta take that whole big plug out. And that's definitely gonna leak all over the place. So might as well drain the coolant at this point. Now it looks like the drain is on this lower hose. So uh, we're gonna crack that open. See what we get. Well, there's liquid coming out. That's promising. It's not really coming out the hole where it's supposed to. Looks like we're taking this thing all the way out. Yep, oh, yep, pulling everywhere. That actually looks pretty clean. It's not brown or muddy or anything. The coolant's supposed to go through that hole. Uh, it's clearly clogged. So we're gonna clean that one out. That is in there tight. We got a pipe on the ratchet. Bent my pipe. Trying to break her bar. 
pipe on a breaker bar. Oh, it moved. I ended up splitting my piece of pipe though. They don't make random scraps of metal like they used to. Well, I got the uh, fitting with the sensor in it out of the block. So we just have to pop these two apart. Huh, that might have blown out on me. It wasn't in there that hard. Okay, now a little bit of cleanup and uh, put a new sensor in and hopefully the new sensor fits. Now, I want to clean out the inside of this fitting and those threads and a wire brush would be ideal, but this is the smallest one I have and there's no way that's fitting in there. So, I need to make this one smaller. I'm sure nothing will go wrong with this idea. There, I got a little wire brush now. Now it's nice and clean inside. This is the original adapter. My gauge didn't fit in here, and the thread was a lot bigger than the adapter that came with the gauge. So, went with the adapter that came with the gauge, and then a pipe fitting that went from half to three quarter. All right. Now, we should have a temperature gauge that works. This is running well earlier today. And then it sounded like it was getting no fuel. Popped out that plug that was pouring fuel earlier, and there's nothing. I'm gonna turn on the pump, and we're gonna see if anything comes out of there. I am seeing no fuel whatsoever. The pump's running, but nothing's coming out. That looks like the float in there. Looks like they're all the way down. Which means there's no fuel in that bowl at all. I know I'm not getting fuel out of here. I'm gonna crack the line and see if I get fuel out of there. Line's loose, that's open. I'm gonna hit the power and see what happens. We got fuel there, but not here. Yeah, we have to take this carb apart again. It's a little bit dark out. I'm gonna deal with this in the morning. We'll see you tomorrow. I got daylight again, so this carburetor's coming off. At least the top of it. Already I'm noticing there is some black debris on the, uh, what that passes for a needle. I don't know if I can call it a needle because it's not pointed, but uh, whatever that is, it used to be a needle. I'm suspecting that line that I flushed out wasn't done giving up loads of stuff. We found our problem. That thing is completely clogged. All this stuff, all the black, already has come out of this and there's still more. So, uh, yeah, apparently flushing out that line was definitely not good enough. Learn from my mistakes. Don't do it that way. All that was just in the needle and seat and I can only imagine what's inside all the jets now. I might have to take that whole carb apart. We'll try putting this on and see what happens. So the line is now going through this filter and out to the carburetor. I have this plug out. I'm going to turn the pump on and uh, I'll shut it off as soon as I see fuel dribble out. Now that is actually the float in there. If all goes well, you should see that go up. If all goes badly, the camera will get sprayed with gas. If it goes worse, it'll catch on fire afterwards. I think I see it moving. Yep, it's moving. Yep, I just heard the pump pick up a little bit, but the fuel level is right about where that screw is, so that should be fine. Now I'm going to try this again, see if cleaning that seat out actually did it, or if I filled the carburetor with junk and it's all got to come apart again. Now that sounded pretty good. That's burning clean, I don't see any smoke at all. Oil pressure looks good. We are uh, using some juice, but that's to be expected because there's no charging system. And it's not warm yet, but these should all be working. Someone removed the original side panels here. I assume for more cooling. The other half track had some little short side panels. Panels like this. And they attach with the original hinges. The only thing is that when they made the nose square, this one's angled. So I'm gonna have to trim off that end to fit the angle, but uh, I think that'll be better. And I'll just paint these to match.
The grocery store baking department is a great place to get things for spray painting. Well, I got those side panels painted up now and uh, had a little bit of fun with the uh, vinyl cutter. So we'll see how this looks. Now, I didn't have a hood on here, so I have no idea what the original numbers were. After discussing the star with Dave, and he mentioned that the hood number for a half track should begin with a four. Now, I don't want to completely make up something, but I noticed that my chassis number also began with a four. So I went ahead and used that. Um, I know this doesn't have enough digits, it's not correct, but uh, it's close enough and at least it means something to this half track. Now, let's see if we can get this thing bolted on. I kind of like that, I think that's okay. But now, I'm missing the big star on the hood. I had to get wider vinyl. Using vinyl, I gotta get around these hinges. And uh, you don't have to deal with that if you're painting, but with a sticker you do. But I think I could put it right on the hinges and that should do it. Oh, this is not going well. I've stuck part of it down and committed now. I think I'll just razor blade around the hinges and the seams and call it good. And there we go. It's not perfect, but I'm okay with that. Oh, she's back up running functional and handy again so i'm gonna end the video there because that was a big win and uh when i end on a high note there's a few small things i still need to do like the brakes and minor stuff but uh for now at least i can use it around the yard and it's a lot more fun now that it works decently so i hope you guys are having fun with your projects too we'll see you next time